in terms of um, excitable tissue that are able to generate action potentials, we've got two types. One is the contractile cells. So that's the bulk of the heart tissue contracts, right? That should be no surprise. I'm gonna kind of circle it's most of it. There's two nodes that um, deviate from this. So this is 99% is contractile. Its job is to excite, be excited, depolarize, and then contract after that. The two exceptions are these two nodes. There's one here and one about here. Um, this is the AV node, atrioventricular node. This is our SA node. Um, and this is where we're gonna have pacemaker cells. They are cardiac cells that still generate action potentials, but it, their job instead of contracting is to initiate the signal, initiate the action potential that then can travel to the contractile cells. So these cells actually are autorhythmic. They depolarize without any external input. Really pretty cool. That's how a heart beats um, outside of the body for as long as it has some oxygen and glucose to make ATP to keep functioning. And that's set by the rhythm of the pacemaker cells. So we'll come back to looking at the pattern of this generation um, from these nodes. But first, we're going to look at each of these two cell types in this order. So first, we'll start with these contractile myocytes. So they are cardiac muscle. OK, so let's graph the um, action potential in these myocytes. I'm also going to just write up here. These are contractile cells. OK, so let me write some numbers over here. I'm going to go down to minus 90. These cells are a little bit more negative than your skeletal muscle, um, not a whole lot different. And then we got plus 30 over here. And we'll have zero somewhere like this, probably um, minus 60 around here somewhere. Just kind of give you some scale. Exact numbers are not going to be my emphasis. And then we're going to have a resting memory potential. So I just mentioned it's more negative than in your skeletal muscle. So resting membrane is potential is going to be down here. We're going to have um, a stimulus that's going to cause depolarization to threshold. When threshold is reached, we're going to have a rapid rise up to the maximal potential. Oops. Ah. OK, let's do it again. Slow rise, rapid rise. When I'm up here, I'm going to do something different. I'm going to have a plateau. A plateau, plateau before we come down. So let's talk about what causes these, these different um, steps here. Some things are going to be similar to what you know already. Right, you know about um, positive ions rushing in to cause depolarization. So what causes the myocyte to reach threshold? So this reaching threshold in our neuron, that's typically a, a ligand gated channel opening, more than one, um, or a mechanically gated channel opening here, it's gap junctions. So ion flow through gap junctions are going to allow things like primarily sodium. Um, sodium ions are going to come in from the adjacent, adjacent cell, right? If this is the cell right next to the pacemaker cell, it's going to come from that pacemaker cell. But it could come from an adjacent cardiac contractile cell as well. So um, that's what's causing the cell to reach threshold. Say threshold's about right here. When threshold is reached, then we've got the, right, our usual um, stuff happening. We have voltage gated, what? Sodium channels. That causes the opening of more voltage gated sodium channels. And we've got this rapid depolarization. Up here, we're going to have, as you can see, something different happen. So normally, at this peak up here, we've got potassium channels open. That does still happen. 
Um, but we're going to have some different types. So these ones, there's actually, I'll just put here, some fast voltage gated potassium channels open. That's not anything super new, right? Normally that would cause repolarization. However, these cells are a little different. Differential gene expression, there are some other channels here. There are also voltage gated calcium channels. These open just around the same time as the potassium channels, just after is actually kind of a little lump here. So if calcium channels open, which way does calcium flow? Remember there's more calcium outside the cell than inside. So calcium is going to go in, into the cell. That's gonna counteract our potassium that's going out. So that's this plateau here. It's a prolonged action potential. That's gonna be really important. Come back to it. After a while, the, those calcium, calcium flows down its electrochemical gradient, stops having that drive. Um, so some more potassium channels are, are continuing to open. So this is kind of a side note, slower potassium channels open. Even without that, the idea that basically that calcium signal fades away, all the calcium has flowed in, but potassium continues to flow out. As potassium flows out, and that's the only thing that's happening now, we have repolarization. Yeah. So this whole time period is a lot longer than our skeletal muscle action potential, which I told you was about, I think one to two milliseconds. This is gonna be more like 200 milliseconds for this entire thing, two to 300 milliseconds, a lot longer. So let's look at this in a, um, another image here and then look at why this matters. Here's the same thing I just showed you. So this would be the action potential in one of these cells right here. And here you can see how that might be getting the signal initially from gap junctions from this cell. So that signal will be carried on from cell to cell through gap junctions. So what are these, um, actually let me draw a scale down here. So this is about, I have it on the next figure. It's gonna be about 300 milliseconds total. Kind of this whole picture here. And what are these different phases due to, right? First we've got sodium channels opening. First, um, there's the voltage gated is what's causing that rapid depolarization. The slow calcium channels are opening and the calcium channels close. We've got no longer have that gradient and the potassium channels are, are open. Potassium channels are, also, are, are starting to open actually here, more open as we go. So again, these are the non-pacemaker cells. Um, and let's now look down at, so they're contractile cells, right? So this is the depolarization. This is gonna correspond and cause contraction, right? That's it, that excitation contraction coupling. So let's graph tension on the y-axis like we did previously for skeletal muscle. Here's tension. And now you can see kind of the result of these refractory periods. Because the action potential is prolonged, so are the refractory periods. So the relative refractory period um, is this, absolute refractory period is here. This is where right, we cannot generate another action potential and we, or we cannot, it takes a lot of um, a larger stimulus to generate one. So comparing this to skeletal muscle, it looks very different. We cannot have another action potential generated until this action potential is already well repolarizing. Tension has, is being reduced. And that's just because of this prolonged, this plateau that causes a prolonged action potential, delays that refractory period. So we cannot have um, multiple, we cannot have more tension until after this point. Why would we want that? We don't want our heart muscle to summate, to be able to sum more than one action potential together. We don't want it to be able to get close to tetanus. If our heart muscle is in tetanus, that's a really bad thing. 
it's not going to be able to pump blood effectively. We want to be able to have tension release, tension release, tension release in a very regular manner, which is not necessarily true with our skeletal muscles, but we want to be able to sometimes have um, fluid and constant contraction. So let's do a learning check here. Which of these is cardiac muscle cells, the contractile, and which one is skeletal muscle? <clears throat> 